So we are back for the next session, this time with Holger and his favorite topic, I think of all time, <laughs> reproducible builds. The stage Thank is yours. You. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I will talk about reproducible builds the first 10 years. So what are you talking about? Please stop talking, noisy people. Um, right. Um, so this is the disclaimer for the talk. When I gave this talk last month, it was an early beta release. I couldn't finish it as much as I wanted to. And then I was thought, okay, I prepared for the next version. Um, and this morning I wanted to cancel this talk. Of course, the last week I didn't manage to do anything on this talk, hardly anything on reproducible builds. Um, but I decided against canceling it. I hope I won't regret it. I hope you won't regret it. Um, and no USB devices were harmed during the presentation of this talk. Um, because my laptop broke, and the new laptop doesn't have USB, it doesn't have working USB, um, and it broke when I went to Denmark last week to prepare this event and the talk, and then I came back and my laptop was not working, and the first Monday here I couldn't do anything, and then I had to prepare the talk. And all I did was updating the firmware of this Lenovo ThinkPad, dear Lenovo, there's no update since a year, and we will talk after this week. <laughs> So this talk will be a bit more chaotic, especially the second half than I'd like. I'm very unhappy. But I'm sure I will learn and improve. I think the event went smoother than ever, so maybe next time I will have a, we will have a smooth event and a good prepared talk from me. We'll see. Anyhow, enough disclaimers. And maybe the next disclaimer, maybe the talk should not be my first 10 years, but it's not about my work because reproduce. Reproducible builds is like free software is a collective effort. So this talk is the work of these people. And if you are missing there, please speak up. <laughs> um, so, oh wait. So these are 150 people so far who contribute to re reproducible builds in one way or another. Thank you. Um, so I'm Holger Levsen, I'm located in Hamburg, and I'm the Debian user almost in 30 years. And I love Debian. And I've been working on reproducible builds since nine years, and trying to make all software reproducible. Um, and ask me anything, anytime, whether during this talk or during lunch or whatever, I'm happy to talk about reproducible builds. <laughs> So about you, Rob, who knows about reproducible builds, why and how? Liars. <laughs> um, who contributes or has contributed to reproducible builds? Thank you. Who knows that reproducible builds have been known for more than 10 years? You all have seen too many talks about this topic. <laughs> Who knows that reproducible builds have been around for more than 30 years? Okay. They have. No, it's not from NetBSD. I'll explain. Who knows about SBOM? Hmm, a few people. So SBOM is Software Bill of Materials, which basically are our build info files from 2014 and SBOM were invented in 2021 or something. I'll explain SBOM in a bit. So, reproducible builds. Yay. So, can you, what is the problem? Source code of free software is available. It's not a problem. Problem is most people install pre-compiled binaries and no one knows whether they're really correspondent. Um, and as a result, there are various classes of supply chain attack. Because you can, between the software source code and the binary you get, um, <coughs> there can be ex backdoor or exploits done. So our solution 
is enable anyone to independently verify that a given source produces bit by bit identical results. That's straight from the web page. And reproducible builds are an important building block in making supply chains more secure. Nothing more, nothing less. So a software which is reproducible might be secure or not. That just doesn't have to do anything to each other. And as a side effect, it's nice that we can be sure with um, reproducible binaries coming from free software that they are free software. Because then we really know this binary comes from the source. So the only way to be certain that a binary is free software is if it's reproducible, then you know that. Else there might be bits in there which are not free because they are backdoor. So our definition, when is the build reproducible? A build is reproducible if given the same source code, build environment, and build instructions. Any party can recreate bit by bit identical copies of all specified artifacts. Or simpler said, if you have some inputs and defined algorithm, you want the same output. And this is the definition of the build environment and the build instructions. And this is all from straight from reproducibles.org slash docs, where we have a definition of this and this is how we define it. Um, and this by now has been largely and widely understood. So we have documented it, we have resources where we have talks we've been given, docs are um, description how to tackle certain problems, and publications are scientific publications. So if you go to our webpage, we have these talks, we have documentation, we have academic publication, it's all there. And there was, in 2021, there was a statement from the White House, the U.S. government, about um, cyber security and supply chain, and on page 42, under advanced migrations, they, they recommend reproducible builds. And in this, following from this um, briefing room paper from the White House, there were also this SBOM thing I mentioned. SBOM, the software build of material, is a description of what's in software. In the uh, English-speaking word, there's BOM, bill of material, which describes the ingredients of food or other stuff. Um, and so software bill of material describes the ingredients of software, and our build info files are basically this. And because of this White House paper, the U.S. government this year or next, next year, all software sold to them will have a SBOM file. And what we say is SBOM files are nice, but they are just, again, you need to believe somebody. If you have a build info file, a verified SBOM file, you can be sure that this SBOM file can be used to reproduce the software. So this is how we, where we are going now. And I would like to show you now some bits from a presentation from more, not, almost 10 years ago at the CCC Congress in 2013. Mike Perry and Seth Schoen from the Tor Project um, gave this presentation, and I'll show bits of it because it's quite interesting. So this is this blip, who they are. I want to believe what I explained, the source code correspondence. Um, but I'm the developer. I know my machine. I compiled it myself. I'm responsible. And why should I be um, worried about hypothetical ris uh, risks? Oops. Um, because we think that software, developing software is being, I'm not interesting, I'm just doing Debian, I'm just doing a small packages. But um, attackers target users through developers, because then they target one developer, they get all the users. Um, and there has been um, successful attacks against infrastructure by the Linux kernel, by FreeBSD. This has been going on for years. This is not hypothetical. And there are really um, difficult to detect compromises, um, which I get in a second. So the, imagine the most secure computer in the world, but can it be still secure if it's networked, if it's f a physical access, if it has a random USB device, it runs a Windows VM, that does several shit. Um, because if you compromise your developer station, you get access to hundreds of millions of computers, maybe every bank account, every user for a certain application, and some applications are more important than others. 
And also there's lots of money available to attack you. Um, so Bitcoin's motivation was, when Bitcoin started to become valuable and was worth the first billion, the developers were afraid if there was a, a backdoor Bitcoin binary um, that the blame would be on them. So they made sure that the Bitcoin bills were producible, that if there's a, a backdoor Bitcoin binary, they can prove this was not, not from them. So they did it at first there. Um, and then Zit and Mike showed how small this backdoor can be. This was the CVE 2002-83 about OpenSSH remote root. And the diff is one bit. This is the diff. And here it's one character. In assembler, it is. You spot the difference in assembler? <laughs> it's again in the middle, the missing E. And um, that's in binary, it's just that one bit is different. So there's one bit different in 500 kilobytes, and it's a remote root exploit or not. So every bit counts. And in hex, yeah, this is the same. There's the And they even went further. They created a Linux kernel module, which shows differently if you um, look at it with an editor or less. But if a compiler accesses this, it has a different contents. Um, so you cannot see this anymore. <laughs> so there's very sophisticated attacks. And the solution there is reproducible builds. <laughs> Still don't find bugs in the code, but you find bugs introduced later. Um, yeah, I go back to my slides now. Um, so this is how this all started like 10 years ago, and this is fast forward 10 years again. Because fast forward to 2023, in April there was a mail on the WireGuard mailing list. WireGuard is a VPN client for Android. And they announced that their builds are now reproducible and they release, release the exact identical binaries on their web page, on Google Play, and on F-Droid. And they didn't even announce that to us. They just wrote it on their mailing list and it's just normal business today. This is huge success. I'm really super happy. Um, so how did we get there? Money and Edward Snowden. <laughs> Why money? Bitcoin, I explained this. And they, they wrote Git Gitian, which is a, their build system, which had the aim to make b reproducible builds. And this was in 2012. That was even before the talk I just showed. Or 2011, okay. <laughs> and Snowden, well, kind of obvious for security implications, and that led the Tor developers made the Tor browser to be reproducible, because they also, for privacy security reasons, they wanted feared these attacks. And Tor browser is Firefox, and that's one of the biggest software in the world. And then Luna thought, okay, let's talk about making Debian reproducible, and. It, 2013 in Switzerland, he made this boff um, about reproducible builds. Who of you have been at this boff? So three people in this room. I haven't been there. <laughs> um, but there were earlier works. There were a threat in 2003 on the Debian mailing list. Um, where is it? Oh, this is... Um, where somebody wrote, I think it would be really cool if Debian policy required that packages could be rebuilt bit by bit identical from source. At the moment, it's impossible. And the replies were, nah, uh, why? I can't see no benefit. Um, and somebody else wrote, what was that? Uh, anyhow, though, so there were several replies, and basically people thought this was impossible. Those names you mentioned are gone by now. No, the people I had, I, I don't want to name names there now, but those two people are still around. And the idea even appeared in the year 2000 on Debian Devil for the first time. 
And then in 2017, we learned from John Gilmour, who's one of the um, Sequin, the, the GC, who uh, produced GCC in the 90s, and that they made GCC, GDB, bin utils reproducible on eight architectures in 1990. <laughs> and that bit rotted. GC, this GCC is still reproducible, but not the whole suite and not on architectures, and it's only been reproducible again after work from us. So this was forgotten. Um, and I also he heard rumors that slot machines would be reproducible due to value-added tax fraud fears, that the government stated this. And I could never, and it, because in early days, machines had four kilobytes or even less memory, and then of course people knew every byte that they put on those machines. But then it was 640 kilobytes, we're not enough anymore, and now we have gigabytes and soon terabytes of RAM, and nobody knows what's running there anymore. Um, and it became just unimaginable that you could know everything which is in the computer. And in fact, in two th last year I learned about an Italian company doing certification for gambling machines using Diffoscope. <laughs> um, it's not they're not about bit by bit yet, but they are working on this and they're getting there, and it's again for tax reason and for legal reasons, which I found very funny. Diffoscope, most of you know it, or I guess all in the room know it, but for the others I'll explain a bit later. And this is one of the um, unexpected benefits, but quite so five years ago we learned that um, people would like to use Diffoscope or reproducibles for license compliance just to be able to know what's in the software. And another benefit, which most of you have seen, is um, for software development. If you do this change, does it only have this change? Diffoscope is great to see this. If you raise the debt helper level, and you can see that it's still the same binary. Or if you have a security fix, that you see it only affects this part of the software. So small detour about Diffoscope. Who knows about Diff or who doesn't know about Diffoscope? That is probably easier. Any? Ha! Huh. Two people. Excellent. Who uses Diffoscope? You! Um, so Diffoscope... Um, I should close these windows. This, this is the web page Diffoscope, and um, Diffoscope does in-depth comparison of files, archive, and directories. Um, it will recur recursively unpack archives of many kinds and transforms them the, the binary format difference in a human readable format. It can compare two tables, two ISO images, two PDF files, to anything. And you can use it via Docker, and it's in Debian and blah. And this is a small example, so you can hardly guess it here that the diff is there in this orange part and not in the yellow one. Um, I think as most of you have seen Diffoscope, so I will not give a wider example, but. This is the amount of file formats Diffoscope detects, and as you can see, there are many. <laughs> and it's packaged for Fedora, Arch Linux, there's a Docker thing, and you can install it from pip. And you can also go to try.diffoscope.org and upload two objects there, and then Diffoscope will be run for you. Um, and you can Diffoscope to four gigabyte ESOs. If the diff is small, then it will not take much time even. Um, so, back to 2013, Luna's BOF. Then we had another BOF at DEPCON 4, 14. Um, and there the first patches for dpackage were developed, so for sorting the contents of the, the Debian archives inside the R archive, and we created this built-info file concept, which is now be has become SBOM. We, we st still call it build info file, but these are SBOM files, which go back to 2014. And in September 2014, I started syst systematic builds of Debian packages twice. First, I literally built 100 packages in a shell loop, in a, in a loop in my shell, and later I made it automated this more. And this was December 2013, and they showed, oh, 14. 
because th- my and they showed my graphs. So I was sitting in the audience and suddenly saw these graphs, which was like, oh wow. Um, this was the graph back then. Um, the green is the reproducible packages and unstable. The orange one are the unreproducible ones, and the red are not building. And here I f- we made some toolchain reproducible that made a huge difference. And now we are here, and this gap in the middle is there on the very left, because this goes now till until last month. So unstable is this is still unstable. Um, I hope I have done the next one. No, I haven't. Because if you look at bookworm, if you remove the build path variation, we are at 96% reproducible. So it's a lot greener then. Um, I get to that. That's eight years of work on this graph. So... In 2015, Luna and myself gave a talk at FOSTEM, and where we invited the free software world at large to collaborate at this problem. And that had quite some uh, results, I guess. Also in the same year, Luna made a presentation at CCC camp explaining in detail how to tackle certain problems. So this is a good video to watch still. Um, and we wrote the source state epoch specification, um, which is the last modification of the source code because we don't want build timestamps because they are uh, unreproducible and the last modification of the source code of the released source code doesn't change. And so we wrote, wrote the spec and um, the spec, let's close all this. This is the it's really just some definitions and this is motivation and the spec is does it fit on a screen? Yes, it fits on a screen. <laughs> so this is source state epoch. Um and it's a Unix timestamp, the number of seconds in epoch of the last modification of the source. And source state epoch was adapted by probably a hundred different source codes now, like GCC respects that if source state epoch is set, the software is then not using build dates if it can, but source state epoch. So compilers respect it, but also importantly documentation packages, which document um, toolkits, because often you have this, this manual was built on this date, and if source state epoch is set, then it will replace that with source state epoch, and it becomes reproducible. Um. And we had the first reproducible build summit in Athens, where I don't remember, 25 people from 15 projects came. Um, there was Arch Linux people there, there were OpenWOT people there, and it started a nice collaboration. We had then more summits in Athens, Berlin, Paris, Marrakesh, and Venice last year. This year we'll meet at Doc Europe <laughs> in November, um, which is here. And we had these projects there. Um, so there was Maven people there, Basil, BaseRock, Eclipse. Uh, Google was there, Geeks was there, several universities. Um, Zuse was there, NetBSD. Quite a bunch, and some were not, didn't want to be mentioned, so there were more than these. Um, so what we have found the most common reason for unreproducible unreproducibilities is timestamps. Timestamps, timestamps, timestamps. Don't put timestamps in software. And the other is build passes and build passes and all the rest. Um, and the rest is like 500 different kinds of issues. <laughs> well, 500 issues is with timestamps, so the rest is probably just two or 300 issues. Yes? Uh, was ordering such a small thing? Or ordering. Random ordering is an issue, but it's a rather big issue. After, because timestamps you can fix with source state epoch, and build paths you can fix by using predictable build passes. So then the biggest issue is probably ordering. (laughs) Because there's also many causes for wrong ordering. There can be um, times, 
time not time soon, but locale can different ordering. There's hashes which are unsorted, and there's different hashes, and so there are several classes. Um, yeah, I will only express timestamps and build passes. I've basically already done this. Um, I skipped this because I have this. this is what I meant to talk is sometimes a bit chaotic. <laughs> um, yeah. And the build pass variation, like, up, this is the first time I say it publicly in a Debian crowd. Um, we we ha used to say um, that um, we vary the build pass in testing, but not in unstable, because we want to fix this build pass variation. Because it would be nice if software would be built reproducibly even if the build pass is varied. And we try to fix this build pass variation, and it's still valid because some are really not needed, but some are really hard to do. So we came up with the workaround, record the build pass, and just do the rebuilds in the same build pass, and then fine. And then in last month, I had a discussion with Vagrant, and we came up with a much simpler solution, just use predictable build passes. Um, with user namespaces, uh, even on the same host, there can be two or 200 builds with the same build pass. It should not hurt. We just need to f um, address um, S build, I think, in the Debian build infrastructure, and then have, we have predictable build passes, and the problem is gone. Because what's the point of arbitrary build passes, in my opinion? But I'm happy to discuss this later. <laughs> um, so as I said, this is unstable. And this is Bookworm, and Bookworm looks much better because we don't vary the build pass there. This is the only change in testing. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, maybe it's 1 or 2%. Uh, Paul asked whether there's less old stuff in unstable, and the diff is very small. Um, yeah, and so <laughs> what I explained a bit is partly described on the, our pay, web page at slash docs history, but it ends in 2015, and lots of developments are not there. So Arch Linux has done a lot. They have rebuilders and Pac-Man bin trans, which is binary, binary transparency, which is the same idea as certificate um, transparency. So you lock the hashes of all binary in a um, append-only lock, and then you can see whether you get the binary everybody else got. And Arch Linux has done this for Pac-Man, but Pac-Man is their up tool. Um, then we have CI builds and not rebuilders. Or um, CI builds is where we just do two builds twice and compare and do maximum variation to see if something is unreproducible. And rebuilders is not to try to do the variation, but rather try to rebuild what FTP Debian org distributes in the Debian case, and um, Frederick does that, and Arch Linux does that, Frederick does this for Debian, Arch, Arch Linux also does it them. And um, another change, which is really nice, that Fedora in the last year, I'm not sure it was this year or last, so in the last 12 months, they enabled reproducible builds macros for RPM, so Fedora builds could also be reproducible, and this is should be all on the history page, um, which is where I had ended this talk in a way, because <laughs> the preparation was not so good. Um, yes, but do you want to hear more? And the following is mostly the data is from September 22, because I didn't have time to update it, but in detail, in detail I have updated it, and in detail the changes were simple. And yeah, please excuse the long letter, I didn't have time for a shorter one. Um, tails um, is reproducibly, because they're only reproducible, but I wrote easy, because they only have one ISO. So it's not 30,000 when you put a database, that's the one ISO. And it's pragmatically solved because they have introductions how to do it, and they don't release the tails ISO if it's not reproducible, and individual people can just rebuild and then see if it's fine, which is nice, totally good. 
Arch Linux has rebuilders, but it also lacks user tools and other integration, a bit like Debian. Um, and Arch Linux is more or less at the same numbers. Um, I think this is also with the build pass variation, that's why they're a bit behind. SUSE has, uh, has active development, but only one person, and it's not enabled in the official builds, but they know how to do it. NixOS um, have a nice web page now, and they are 99.87% reproducible. I'm not sure how small the packages are, it's one or two packages. Oh, no, it says two packages. Um, and Geeks, also they have a Geeks challenge where you can rebuild individual packages. And Yocto, this um, embedded um, build system, also has support for reproducible images, but Yocto is a source-based thing, so that's that. And F-Droid supports reproducible builds, but they don't have a UI, and they don't have any promises. Wait a second. Um, and so you, you need to manually crawl a, a HTTPD page and then see if there's this file exists, then the F-Droid package is reproducible and else the other one not. So this is not so good. And that also exposed one problem, because the Corona um, contact tracing app in Ger for Germany, they were, it was reproducible, but then there was an update which wasn't reproducible, so f didn't publish the update, because f has the, pub the policy to only do re releases of software. If the package is reproducible, then the, the new version has to be reproducible again, which is good, but it's bad if there's a security update which is not reproducible. And we don't know how to do this, but we've seen this use case already. <laughs> Helmut, does your question just a fit? Uh, Yocto has actually gotten one step further and ahead of Debian, I think. They are using reproducible builds to uh, speed up their build cache. So when the output artifact of something is the same as the previous build, even if the build inputs changed, they know they don't have to redo all the downstream builds. So that's also another benefit there. Yeah. That's that's a benefit also other com companies are doing it because it also costs developer time. If you, some can cost, if the developer needs to wait, if the product has been built and reproducible builds make faster builds. So I know companies who do reproducible builds for faster build to use caching, as Helmut has explained. Um, Alpine has basic support, FreeBSD also. I'm a bit faster because I only have 10 minutes left. Um, so many projects support reproducible builds by now, but it's unclear what it means, how it's enforced, and how users can know and be confident. And 96% is hardly ever enough. It's bad for two reasons. First, that's still, I think, 800 unreproducible packages in Debian, and I'm using at least 10 of those. So my images are not reproducible because of those 10 packages, and also, so, and we have Debian um, required and essential are reproducible package set in Debian, but build essential is already not reproducible. So basically each package set has one package at least which is unreproducible, which is annoying because we would like to have no UI at all for the user, that we can just enable reproducible builds and then all the software is reproducible because else you have this, this software is in unreproducible. Do you really want to install it? And everybody will say, yes, I want this anyway. And then you, that will be a bad user experience, so we want 100% really. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And there's also, of course, in the back end, it's hard, to, we don't really know how to do this yet because it's, else we say the software is reproducible, but then you need to believe me or the reproducible builds project and we want rebuilders and how we don't know how the scaling will be done there and trust issues and stuff. Um, oh yes, there's also other nice projects related to this. I didn't back, I probably didn't backdoor this as a fine manual of a simple hello world in Rust it reproduces one ELF binary and a Docker image and an Arch Linux package. And the idea is that you can reproduce these steps and see this is not backdoored. It's a 
it's a nice re thing to read. And the other is an unreproducible package where B Bernard Wiedemann collected pr um, stuff which makes the package unreproducible. So I think there's one, br it's one branch where the package is unreproducible and another branch where it's made reproducible with the fixes in it. Because um, it's much easier to show pitfalls than how, how to make it right. So it shows how to make it wrong so you don't do that. Um, Debian, as I said, this was discussed in 2014. This is, well, this is the talk in Heidelberg where Luna, um, Dole, Lambi, and me gave the talk. This was a boff in Heidelberg. And we had reproducible builds talk at several DEP confs. Um, and I've given several times the warning that the next Debian release will not be reproducible. So what do you think about Trixie or Forky? What's the name after Forky? <laughs> um, and I th <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm, in a way, I'm frustrated and happy at the same time happy for the, all the progress we made and frustrated that there's still so much progress to be made. Um, and I, I'm, overall, I'm happy with reproducible builds. For stretch, we were in theory, because the dpackage build was not there, we were in theory but not in practice release. In Buster, yeah, we could, but we were not the build info files, we were not ready. And Bulls I the same, and um, maybe Bookworm will be the first Debian release, or I'm just, I think that Bookworm will be the first Debian release with some meaningful reproducibility. Um, <coughs> yeah, because this are the CI result part I already explained. We only test against the Debian arc. We, rebuild twice and don't test against the Debian archive. Um, this I had. So for Bullseye, we made 2% progress from compared to Buster, which is, the num if you look at the numbers, it's more impressive because we made 3,000 packages, additional packages reproducible, and that sounds way better than 2% more. <laughs> because also Debian has been growing. Um, and, or put a different way, we solved one third of the remaining 6%. Lying with statistics, very important skill. <laughs> <laughs> and did I say bullseye? So what about bookworm? Um, we are at, at 96.2, so we made 0.2%. But again, we made 1,000 more packages reproducible, I think. So this is still good. Thanks for each and every package you make reproducible. Um, but as I said, we have, we don't have rebuilders. And, up, and recently we didn't have the build info files. And then for, that was for Buster where we thought we fixed it, but then we forgot 3,000. Um, so I uploaded then and then I found 500 more. But now all packages in Bookworm have a build info file except I'm not sure about not non-free firmware. <laughs> so that, but let's ignore that for now. Um, and snapshot, we still have scaling problems that if you want to access it massively to do massive rebuilds, which we need to do for reproducible builds, that doesn't work. There are bugs about it, and we're fixing this. How much more time do I have? What is it? Five more minutes. So I'm skipping this a bit, but... We have, this is Frederick's Rebuilder, and these are results for Debian rebuilds, for Debian distributes on FTP Debian org. And there we are at 81% only. But still, most of the stuff we distribute is reproducible as predicted or hoped. And we just need to get this Rebuilder up more and then do investigations there. Um, and the other problem for getting build essential reproducible, it's Linux, GCC, and I think at the moment bin utils. But Doku is thankfully here, and we'll have a discussion after this talk. So maybe we'll make some progress there. Um, GCC and bin utils and probably other packages 
need to um, save some artifacts. And so there's a special package at the moment, and this package is, of course, unreproducible. And we need to find a way to get this out of the package for packages which need bigger bi build log files. You're looking skeptical, Doku. Is that right? No? Good. Um, and so our mirror we have of snapshot is AMD64 only, um, which is bad. So we want to add ARM64. Um, but um, we, we really would like snapshot Debian org to be fixed. But this seems to be harder, so we work on both in parallel at the moment. So we work around this. We set up our own snapshot. Um, I skipped this a bit. This I already explained. Yes, this is also. I wanted. <coughs> we have reproducible live images now for book form, which are the live uh, images made by Roland Klobus, Klobus with live build, which happened a lot at the reunion last year. And the CD image team has also decided to use this as live images for bookworm. So we'll have reproducible bookworm live images, which is yay. I wish I had this more as a yay slide and not as a hmm. <laughs> um, this thing is, what's this? We don't know about DI images because DI often is not buildable during the development cycles, only become build, buildable at the end, so we haven't done this yet. We've made DI reproducible in Git two years ago, but we haven't tested it yet. So this is lacking there. And um, maybe I'm going for this. We, as Helmut explained, MM Depstrap um, creates reproducible um, Debian bases, and de um, the bootstrap and CD bootstrap can do the same, except they create a directory, and that is not reproducible by default. Um, but if you put this into a tar archive and clamp the timestamp using source like art uh, epoch, then also the bootstrap creates reproducible bases. So once bookworm is released, we can see what we can do reproducibility wise there. Um, I only have one minute, so I'll skip this part. Yeah. Um, Trixie goals. Um, we still have 292, or this is half a year, but probably we still have 250 patches in the archive which are not applied. And we will do mass NMUs starting again once um, Bookworm has been released. Not sure if you noticed it, but before the freeze, Vagrant, Lumbi, and me did basically mass NMUs of binary packages, like we did 10 per week or something. Um, and we want to do this to get these 250 patches applied. Um, yeah, and up could warn, but I don't want this. Um, I, wouldn't, I want, still want Debian policy to say packages must be reproducible, but I think it will be after Forky. <laughs> so probably even two releases after Forky. Thank you. Thank you, Holger, for your 10-year uh, anniversary talk. Um, we're a bit short on time. So I would say if there are any questions, you can approach Holger in the, in the, in the upcoming coffee break. After the break, we will start with uh, discussion sessions uh, rather than talks. And uh, first up, I think, is Mark with a networking session. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>